So this is how we view creativity. An idea comes out of the blue and boom, it explodes over our heads with brilliance. And there's a visual analogy to what's happening inside the human brain. As we get a new idea, synapses fire with electrochemical glow. And this is a remarkably consistent way that we view what happens inside the classroom too, right? Teacher comes in, lights the fuse, and boom, the student's mind lights up. But I'm here to tell you, after 25 years in higher ed leadership, my current role at Autodesk, but most importantly maybe, making fireworks since I was 10 years old, <laughs> that this is most definitely not the way it works. Somebody needs to tell this really disturbing looking clown <laughs> and the kind of demonic child that he seems to be conjuring, which by the way looked an awful lot like me when I was that age, that a big bang is not always a great idea, especially when it's indoors. And my point here is that <laughs> my point here is that we need to create a place for creativity to unfold in education. We need to literally clear a space for it. And that's exactly what's happening right now at universities across the country, over 50% of which are migrating their physical book collections online and using some of that reclaimed floor space for dedicated maker spaces. So libraries in many ways are becoming much less quiet, but much more broadly creative. And at the same time, lecture halls and classrooms are being reconfigured with flexible furniture to drive active and collaborative forms of learning. So there is a student project at Aalto University in Finland that reconceived of using classroom spaces as prototyping spaces for learning by making and reconfiguring the lecture hall as a demo stage. And they did it. They created the first design factory to drive maker forms of innovation and learning. And now there are 10 networked all around the world. But the thing is that the things we make, when we set up a maker space, we need to inspire people to use it and set some guidelines usually. Do any of you know the Crucible in Oakland? It is an awesome maker space, right? And I love their fiery manifesto, forges roar. Neon glows, glass bends, sparks fly, creativity explodes. It's, it's beautiful. But the thing is that the objects we make can be either good or bad. And I learned this firsthand, or it can be misconstrued. I learned this firsthand. For years, I could not figure out why I was being <laughs> pulled out of airport security lines. And it was a consistent problem that I had until I realized that my rather prolific online orders of firework components had been misconstrued. <laughs> so in order to avoid this kind of controversy, the Longhorn Makerspace, a new, amazing, ambitious makerspace at the University of Texas at Austin, has set a, really few, a few really prudent guidelines. One, which makes perfect sense to me, a nonprofit, you can't make money. The second makes even more sense, no weapons, okay? <laughs> so once you've created the space, you've inspired people to use it, you've set some guidelines, you gotta make sure that that space allows multiple knowledge domains to work together. That's so crucial to making creativity happen. I mean, fireworks happen when you mix individual elements together into new dynamic kinds of compounds. The problem is that university departments really aren't set up to interact that way. We keep math and science and art, engineering separate, like divisions on an assembly line. And I think that made perfect sense because our university system was reimagined during the industrial era to serve that society and that economy. So I'm sure industrialist founders like Carnegie and Stanford were applauding, but the problems that we face today are fundamentally different. They don't they, they, we've got to move past that, that neat division of mental labor. Because in order to keep learning relevant today, universities have to adapt. And that's exactly what's happening here. <laughs> 
A hundred students in Pune, India, got together at an Autodesk Design Swarm to confront global water issues. And they did it by working together across backgrounds. A design swarm brings people from all different backgrounds and disciplines together in very constrained time frames to work through elaborate solution sets. And it was incredibly successful. So we needn't wait for lone geniuses to come and solve our problems. In fact, we shouldn't. There is so much research from the last 20 years about how to bring together individuals to create these really powerful, collective, creative brains to solve problems like responses to natural disasters. And that's exactly what Parsons School of Design students did, working with the Red Cross and residents of the Zambezi River Basin in Africa. They created a game called Before the Storm that allowed residents there to role play in response to natural disaster scenarios. So to me, Learning like this just makes sense. It's intuitive, right? But I think it's also a fundamental literacy today, a liberal art for the 21st century. And it shouldn't stop at graduation. So when I was provost at Philadelphia University, we created something called the Undergraduate College of Design, Engineering, and Commerce. But we realized that we wanted to address a much broader group of people from K through gray. And so we took that undergraduate program, which was transdisciplinary, and taught innovation to over half of the undergraduates there, and transposed it to create the Municipal Innovation Academy to address the needs of mid-career professionals in the city of Philadelphia. And then we adapted it again to create the Strategic Design MBA program to address an even broader range of working professionals. So creativity is a wonder, but our first idea isn't always the best, and in fact, it can be a dud. And we need to confront in academia, as in the private sector, when things aren't working and when we need to reframe problems. And that is exactly what Arizona State University has done. They're redefining what it means to be an elite university in this country. Their inclusive admissions policy means that many students can attend and be supported in the most innovative ways to be academically successful. But what I love about Arizona State is the way it has reframed the entire planning process for the future of the university into what is essentially a maker project, complete with eight guiding design principles. So the scope of the make-learn paradigm, it knows no limits. Its ambition can be endless. Tanji University's College of Innovation and Design in Shanghai has made its intentions clear. It wants to help that sprawling city redefine its path forward into a much more sustainable development trajectory. And moreover, it wants to help the economy of China shift from being made in China to a more innovation-driven, created in China. So we're reaching across borders and boundaries, disciplines, and diplomas. But we can't do it alone. Students must demand the kind of education that's going to make them successful over the arc of their career and their lives. And educators must redefine their roles as agents of change. And parents, well, as a parent, I can personally tell you that it is okay <laughs> when your kid comes to you and says, Dad, I want to double major in anthropology and industrial design. <laughs> because we need new mindsets along with our skill sets and tool sets. We know we can't 3D print democracy. We cannot 3D print justice or equality, but by working together, we can use the incredible power of making to light up the skies over us with transformational learning. <laughs>